Um, it is my very honor to uh, welcome you, Tali, to Mountain View here to Google. And um, it is my very honor and pleasure to introduce Tali to you guys um, here in the room. Um, a world-renowned researcher and scientist in the field of cognitive, cognitive neuroscience. Um, Tali investigates how motivation and emotion determine our expectations of the future, our everyday decisions, our memories and our ability to learn. She's talking about her brand new book, The Influential Mind, <laughs> and Tali shows us how to, how to avoid pitfalls um, in our daily struggle to affect others. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my very honor and my very pleasure to pass on the microphone to Dr. Tali Sherrod. Thank you so much, Manu, uh, for inviting me. Um, Manu has been amazing at organizing this and also uh, organizing a previous talk in a conference that he organized in Chicago. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for coming and watching wherever you are. <clears throat> so as Manu said, I'm a cognitive neuroscientist. So that's basically psychology and neuroscience mixed together. And I bring people into my lab, and I try to understand the brain mechanisms that give rise to how people act every day, how they interact, how they make decisions, how they think. And the influential mind is really about how people form beliefs, um, how beliefs can be quite stubborn, but how change is possible if we understand the human mind and if we understand thinking. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is how people process information, how they seek out information, and how they process information to form those beliefs. And, and so that's one kind of uh, point that has a lot to do with what you guys are doing here. But I'm going to start by exploring thinking. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do an experiment with you guys here. So I'm going to give you three numbers. And I want you to figure out the rule that I used to generate those numbers. But for now, just keep it in your mind, OK? Don't say anything. So my numbers are 2, 4, 6. OK. Now, the way that we're going to do it, I'm going to give you an opportunity to give me free numbers. And I will tell you if those free numbers fit my rule or do not fit my rule. And then I'll let you guess the, num the rule, OK? So Manu, we're going to start with you. Give me three numbers, and I will tell you if they fit my rule or not, and then I'll let you guess the rule. I say it's 10 and 12. No, three numbers you need. Three numbers. Yeah. You have to have, so I have a rule, which um, I use to generate these numbers. What you need to do is figure out what this rule is. And the way that we're going to do it is I'll let you test it by giving me free numbers, and I'll tell you if it fits my rule or not. So give me like, any free numbers that you think, and I'll tell you, is it, does it fit my rule or not, and then I'll let you guess the rule. So. Yes, it fits my rule. Do you want to guess the rule? It is the first. It is, you're always adding two up. OK, no, that's not the rule. So we'll do one more. Do you want to give me free numbers? Yeah, it fits my rule. Do you want to guess the rule? Um, it starts with two and does two. No, no, that's not my rule. Uh, now, I think you know the answer because you're poised. So I'll let you do it. Go ahead. Uh, even numbers? No, first of all, you have to give me free numbers. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how about two, four? I, can I give you the same number? <laughs> well, they obviously, they obviously fit my rule, so you can for that. <laughs> it's not even numbers? No. OK, one last thing. Give me free numbers and then guess the rule. Anyone want to have a try? Go ahead. Go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I, I was thinking like 8, 10, 12, and I was thinking like to add a 2, but like yeah. OK, so it does fit my rule. OK, so, um, so my rule was simply escalating numbers. 5, 10, 100 would be a yes. 5, 0, 1 would be a no. OK, what's the point of this experiment? The point of this experiment is to show you that based on a very limited set of data, we uh, form strong beliefs and hypothesis in our head. And then automatically, what we try to do is we try to confirm those beliefs by seeking out confirming evidence. So many people here thought that my rule was escalating even numbers. And so what you automatically do is you, you give me an example of escalating even numbers. So you say 8, 10, 12, right? Um, you're trying to confirm that belief. And what people don't do is they don't try to challenge those beliefs. So another way to get to the truth, if you think it's escalating even numbers, would be to say 135. 
and I would say, yes, it fits my rule, then you would know that your belief is wrong and you would get to the truth faster. So that's an example of what we call the confirmation bias. Now, this specific example was first shown by Peter Wason in 1960. Peter was an academic in my own department at UCL. He passed away a few years before I joined the uh, department. And the reason this experiment is important is not about numbers. Okay? The reason it's important is that we all host uh, a range of beliefs in our heads. We have beliefs about gender. We have scientific theories uh, that we believe in. We have beliefs about religion and belief about ourselves and how our company should work and about our relationships with our family and our colleagues. And what we tend to do without knowing it is that we go about our day every single day trying to find evidence that will confirm and strengthen those beliefs. And rarely do we try to challenge those beliefs. But what happens when we do encounter a piece of evidence or an opinion that doesn't quite fit what we believe in? So we tested this question in the domain of climate change. Um, so together with my colleagues, we conducted a study where we wanted to see whether we can change people's opinions about climate change by giving them information. Now, I'm not only talking about those who do not believe in climate change, but also those that do believe in climate change. Okay? Can we change their opinion as well with information? So the first thing we did is we asked everyone, do you believe in man-made climate change? Do you support the Paris Agreement? And based on their answers, we divided them into the strong believers and the weak believers. Next, we asked them, please estimate by how much do you think the temperature would rise in the next 100 years? So unsurprisingly, the weak believers gave us an estimate that was smaller than the strong believers. Then came the real test. We told half of all our participants that the scientists have reevaluated the data and they now concluded that actually things are not that bad. It's not as bad that they thought before, and the temperature would rise by only a tiny little bit. We told the other half of our participants that the scientists have reevaluated the data and now have concluded the situation is much, much worse than they previously thought, and the temperature would rise by a very significant amount. And please, everyone, give us your new estimate. So the question was whether people will change their estimate based on this information that we gave them. And the answer was yes, as long as the information fit their original worldview. So when the uh, weak believers heard that the scientists are saying, actually, you made a mistake and the, thing, and the situation is not that bad at all, they moved a lot in that direction. But they didn't budge at all when they heard that the scientists are saying things are actually more dire than we originally thought. Now, the strong believers showed the opposite, right? So when they learned that the scientists are saying, actually, things are much better than we thought, the situation is not that bad, they didn't move in that direction. But when they learned the scientists are saying things are much worse than we thought before, they moved a lot in that direction. So this, again, is another example of the confirmation bias, which is basically when you give people data, they are quick to take in the data that fits their original worldview, but assess counter evidence with a critical eye. Now, this phenomena is not new at all, right? It's an old phenomena. But now, when information is so readily accessible, it's having more of an effect on our beliefs because we can found, find data and information and evidence on the web to support anything that we want to believe in. And so what's happening is that groups are moving to extremes, right? And so information can actually cause polarization instead of bringing people together because of this bias. So we wanted to know what goes on inside the human brain when people encounter opinions or a piece of data that doesn't really fit their view. So the way that we did that is we brought people into our lab in pairs, and we asked them to make financial decisions together. Specifically, they had to assess real estate. And while they were doing that, we recorded their brain activity in two MRI scanners, but they could communicate with each other over computers. So the way that it works is each person lies down like this, and there's a little head coil. Never mind. There's a little head coil uh, with a mirror. And the mirror can project anything that we want from a computer screen. So we show people the questions. We show them the opinion of their partner. And they put their answers using the button box here. And while we do that, 
we record their brain activity using this method that's called functional MRI. So what we found was when two people agreed, each person's brain showed precise encoding of the information given by the agreeing partner. So what I'm showing you here is a slice of the brain. If I were to cut your brain like this and then look inside, and I'm highlighting all the regions that we found were encoding the information coming from an agreeing partner. And what happened was when two people agreed, their confidence in their own opinion and their own decision went up. So, so far this is not surprising, right? If another person agrees, your confidence goes up. However, when the two people disagreed, metaphorically speaking, it looked as if the brain was shutting down and we couldn't find evidence that it was encoding the information coming from a disagreeing partner. And what happened to people's confidence in their own decision? It didn't change much. There was only a non-significant decrease. So people were kind of ignoring it. Interestingly, <coughs> Sometimes we blacked out the computer screen, so people couldn't see what others were thinking. Nevertheless, in those situations, people also became more confident in their own decision. I can only assume that they were thinking that the other person's probably agreeing with them, they just can't see it, and they became more confident too. So many times when people see this, they ask me, um, well, is this true for everyone? Is there individual differences? Well, if you see yourself as highly analytical, which I think most people in this room do, um, embrace yourself. So a study conducted um, by Dan Kahan at Yale University showed that people with better math skills are more likely to twist data at will. So he tested 1,000 Americans. And the first thing he did is he gave everyone math questions and analytical questions, logic questions. And based on those questions, he divided them into those with high skills and those with low skills. And then he gave them two sets of data. The first set of data, he told them, was looking at whether skin treatment was helping rashes. And he said, OK, look at the data, analyze the data, and tell me if this treatment is helping. Unsurprisingly, those with better math skills did better at this, at this question. Then he gave them another set of data. And this time he said, this set of data is looking at whether gun control laws are reducing crime. Look at the data, analyze the data, and tell me whether uh, gun, controls, um, gun control rules are helping in reducing crime. Now, the difference here is that everyone had very strong opinions about gun control laws, right? Some people were for, and some people were against. And that interfered with their ability to analyze the data. And in fact, those with better math skills did worse because they were using their skills, not necessarily to find the accurate conclusion, but rather to find fault with the numbers that they were unhappy with, right? They had the skills to do so, while the others didn't. Uh, did everyone get the same report and data? Yes, so actually it was the same data. Then isn't it possible that- It was the same data. It just data. happens to be that the people with high math skills happen to have the political opinions that disagree with that data. No, because he did, so it was a two by two design. So there, there was different sets of data? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It was a two by two, but it, yeah, a two by two design, which is sometimes the data would agree with one opinion, and sometimes okay. with the other opinion, and like everything was counterbalanced. Yeah, good question though. Okay, so um, the next question is why would we have a brain that has evolved to disregard perfectly good information when um, it doesn't fit our view? So the answer is that the brain assesses a piece of new evidence in light of the knowledge that it already stores because on average that is in fact the correct approach. So for example, if I were to tell you that I saw a pink elephant flying in the sky, you would assume that I am lying or delusional as you should, right? Because on average, when a piece of evidence doesn't fit a belief that you hold strongly, on average, that piece of evidence is wrong, right? So it's a shortcut that the brain uses um, to assess evidence and incorporate into beliefs, which it actually is quite optimal. It's a, good, it's a good process. However, it also means that strongly held beliefs are very difficult to change even when they're wrong. There are four factors that determine whether a piece of evidence will change your belief. Your current belief, your confidence in that belief, 
the new piece of evidence and the confidence in that piece of evidence. And now the further the piece of evidence is from your belief, the less likely it is to change it. There is one exception though, and that is when the piece of evidence doesn't fit what you believe, but it fits what you want to believe. So let me give you an example. So um, a few months before the presidential election, 1,000 Americans were asked by a group of, of scientists in, in England, um, who do you want to win the election? And who do you think is going to win the election? So back in August 2016, 50% wanted Trump to win, and 50% wanted Clinton to win. But back then, both the Trump supporters and the Clinton supporters believed that Clinton was going to win. Then they were given a new poll, and that poll said, um, and that poll predicted a Trump victory. And they were asked again, okay, now that you've seen the poll, who do you think is going to win? Did it change their prediction? And the answer was yes, it changed their predictions, but mostly it changed the predictions of the Trump supporters. Right? They were elated by this new poll, um, and they were quick to move and say, well, in that case, well, maybe he's going to win. Right? The Clinton supporters, on the other hand, didn't change their prediction much. They said, well, you know, we still think Clinton is going to win. We don't really believe this, Paul. So when people encounter a piece of evidence that goes against what they really want to believe and what they want to happen, our immediate reaction is basically this, right? Denial, rationalization, and trying to just distance ourselves from the fact. And perhaps the most um, efficient way to distance ourselves from the truth or from the facts is not to expose ourselves to that information in the first place. So take, for example, the stock market. Do you know when people check their account to, cheat, to see how much they are worth? So not with any intention to make a transaction, just to have a little peek to see, like, is my stock going up? Have they gone down? So this is a study conducted by three behavioral economists, uh, Lowenstein, Seppi, and um, and Carlson. And what you can see here in black is the S&P 500 over two years. And in gray is a number of times that people logged in to check on their accounts. Now, these are not raw numbers. So they've been corrected for all the obvious confounds, like market volume and willingness to transact and all that. OK, so what do we see? When the market is high, people tend to log in all the time. They say, well, when the market is high, my value is probably has gone up, and they want to get a sniff of the good news. Right? But when the market is down, people are less likely to log in. Um, they say, well, the market is down. I probably lost money, and I don't want to know. Now, all this is true as long as negative information can reasonably be avoided. So what you don't see here is what happened a few months later in the financial collapse of 2008 when the market went drastically down. And that's when people started logging on frantically, but it was a little bit too late. So we know a little bit about the biology that underlies this behavior. And a lot of what we know actually comes from monkeys. So there is a great series of studies by Ethan Borbick Martin at Columbia University. And what Ethan showed is that monkeys, too, want to know about uh, the good stuff ahead of time. So what Ethan did is he did a study where monkeys could get a big reward, which was a lot of water, or they can get a small reward, which is a little water. Now, for monkeys, water was really important. They were quite thirsty. So this was a big deal for them, right? It's kind of like getting $1,000 versus $10. And he asked the monkeys, do you want to know a few seconds in advance whether you're going to get a lot of water or a little bit of water? Now, the monkeys can't talk, obviously, but he trained them over many weeks um, to know what different symbols mean. Right? So like one symbol, they knew if you see the symbol, I will tell you in advance how much water you're going to get. If you see this other symbol, I will not let you know. And so the monkeys use their eyes to indicate, do I want to know or do I not want to know? And then if they said, I want to know, then he showed another symbol. And that symbol said, you're about to get a lot of water. Or he showed another symbol that said, you're going to get a little bit of water. Okay. So first thing he found is, yes, the monkeys want to know. Um, just as we want to know if we got a lot of money, the monkeys want to know that too. The second thing was, they were even willing to pay to know a few seconds in advance how much water they were going to get. 
the way that they paid is they paid by water, right? So it would give up a little bit of water to know a few seconds in advance how much water they were going to get. And Ethan did more than that. He recorded the brain activity um, of the monkeys while they were making, while they were making these decisions. So uh, he inserted electrodes into the monkeys' brains, specifically to part of the brain called the midbrain, where those dopaminergic neurons. And those neurons are known to respond to rewards like water, food, sex. And he recorded those, those neurons. And what you wanted to know is, do those neurons respond not only to your basic rewards like food and water, do they also respond to the opportunity to receive information? Right? He was asking, does a brain treat information as if it's a real reward? So let me show you his results. It's a bit of a complicated graph, but I'll walk you through it. So what we're looking at here is activity of these dopaminergic neurons in the midbrain. And the first thing that you see is the classic finding, which is there's great activity at the moment when the monkeys receive a large reward into their mouth, lots of water. And there's, there's like a decrease when they receive just a little bit. So they're disappointed, right? So basically, these neurons are go up when things are good, and they go down when things are bad. OK, now the important thing. He found that the same exact neurons also fire when the monkey learns that he's about to get information. Kind of like you get an, an email or you get an envelope. You don't know what's in it yet, but you know there's information. The neurons fire to the opportunity to receive information, just as they do to water and food. And when the monkeys learn, I'm not going to give you information, there's a decrease in firing. So they go down. They're disappointed. So Ethan's conclusion was, yes, the brain treats information as if information is reward, like water and food. But when I saw that, I, I asked Ethan, well, is this true for any kind of information? Or is it only true for information about the good stuff? What happens if the monkey's not getting water, it's getting shocks, electric shocks? Does a monkey want to know in advance if it's going to be a big shock or a small shock? So Ethan said, well, I can't shock my monkeys because the um, um, ethics won't allow me to do that. So he said, well, let's do it on undergrads in my, my lab. <laughs> um, and actually, we can get ethics to shock undergrads, but we decided there's no need. And we just use a design where they either get a lot of money or a little bit of money, or they lose a lot of money or lose a little bit of money. And what we found was, <clears throat> first of all, the undergrads looked a lot like monkeys. So they wanted to know in advance whether they're going to get a lot of money or a little bit of money. They were even willing to pay us a little bit for that. Um, and yes, when we recorded the same region that Ethan was looking at in monkeys, we recorded that in undergrads using fMRI, we found the same response. So when they learned they're about to get information about good stuff, these neurons went up. And when they learned we're not going to tell you in advance, they went down. And when it came to losses, we found the opposite pattern. So um, when they learned that they're going to get information about, lo about losses, there was actually a decrease in firing, a disappointment. But when they learned we're not going to tell you about how much you're going to lose, there was actually an increase in firing, as if the brain was treating ignorance as a reward when the ignorance was about the bad stuff. right? And behaviorally, the, um, the undergrads, the more they were likely to win, the more they wanted to know. But the more they were likely to lose, the less they wanted to know. Right? And so this, is, this kind of explains our everyday behavior. Right? We want to know, you know the good stuff. Did I get the job? How much money did I get? But we kind of don't want to go to the doctor to hear you know, about our results. Um, and when we expect a, a bad email coming our way, we don't check our, our phone so much. Um, but when we expect something good, then we check it a lot. Right? So, if the brain treats information about the good stuff like food and water, and it treats information about bad stuff like a shock, well, it's not surprising that we try to find information about the good stuff and try to avoid information about the bad stuff, right? just as we do trying to avoid shocks and trying to get food and water. And so we will end up with a view um, like this of ourselves. Now, our mistake is that. Instead of going along with how our brain works, we often try to go against it. 
we often try to put like a clear mirror in front of people and say, look, look, this is how it looks. This is a data, okay? Things are gonna get worse, or you're wrong and I'm right. And it doesn't often work because the brain will try to frantically distort the information until it gets the picture that it's happy with. But what will happen if we went along with how our brain works, not against it? And that's the idea of the influential mind. Basically what I do in the influential mind, in each chapter I talk about one of these factors that are really important for how people form beliefs and decisions, whether it's a confirmation bias or how we seek information or other factors. And then I say, well, given that we know that, how can we go along with that to make a change? And what kind of mistakes do we do when we try to go against this way that our brain works? Um, <clears throat> so I'm just gonna give you a few examples I'm just going to look at the time to make sure that we have time for questions and everything. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how we can do that. So the first thing I talked about was how the brain um, encodes information much better when it comes from an agreeing partner, right? So our mistake is that usually when we're in a disagreement, we come, we come with like counter evidence, right? It's like, you're wrong, I'm right, here's all the evidence. And it doesn't often work so well. But could we go along with how our brain works? Could we go along with a confirmation bias by first trying to find common grounds? So common beliefs or common motive. So the other person is more likely to kind of encode what we're saying. And let me give you one example of how this has been done. So this is an example that relates to the relationship between autism and vaccines. So some parents decide not to vaccinate their kids because of the alleged link between autism and vaccines. Now, the uh, normal approach of health professionals is to say, well, here's all the data showing that there isn't a link, right? But when people have a very strong opinion, that doesn't seem to work. And there's studies showing that there's really no change in people's attitudes um, when they, they learn this, or very small change. But then a group at UCLA said, well, can we take a different route? Can we get to the same outcome, which is getting um, the parents to vaccinate their kids without actually talking about what we disagree on, but rather talking about what we agree on. And so what they highlighted instead was that these vaccines actually protect kids from the measles, mumps, or rubella, right? Um, this is not something that the parents disagreed on, but it seemed to be d forgotten in the heated debate. So by highlighting, in fact, what they agreed on and also a common motive that they had, which is keeping the, the kids healthy, they were able to change parents' intentions of vaccinating their kids uh, by free fault. So trying to think about what we have in common in order to kind of work with a confirmation bias instead of against it. And there's another reason that this works so well. Um, and that relates to the brain's tendency to encode information <coughs> that suggests progress better than information that suggests decline. So let me first show you an experiment um, that we've done that shows this, and then like, how can we use that knowledge? Um, so in one study, we brought people into the lab and we gave them 100 different events, negative events that can happen to them in their lifetime. For example, cancer. And we said, what is the likelihood do you think that you will encounter this event in your lifetime? Just put in the number, right? So each person puts in the number, and then we say, well, this is the likelihood that you will have cancer based on your age and where you live and the gender and so on is about, for example, 30%, which is actually close to the number in the population. And then we ask them again, how likely are you to have cancer? And a hundred different other events. What we wanted to know is whether the information that we gave them changed their estimates, right? And what we found is indeed it did, but mostly when the information was better than expected. So for example, if someone said, well, I think my likelihood of having cancer is about 50%, and we said, hey, you know, for someone like you, it's only about 30%. It's good news, right? So they, they said, well, in that case, maybe it's only 35%. So when they got good news, they changed their estimate really quite quickly. But if someone said, well, I think for me, my likelihood is about 10%, and we said, you know, for you, it's actually worse. On average, it's probably around um, 30%. The next time around, they said, yeah, you know, still think it's about 11%. So it's not that they didn't change their estimate at all. They did. They learned from bad news. But they learned from bad news less 
than, than from good news. And it's not that they didn't remember the information. They remember the information that we gave them, but they didn't think it was related to them when it was bad news, but they did think it was related to them when it was good news. And we did this study, again, while looking at people's uh, brain activity while they were performing this task. And what we found was that quite a few regions in the brain were responsive to unexpected positive information. They were encoding this information quite well, including this region here, which is called the left inferior functor gyrus. So it sits over here. However, when we gave people bad news, the, another part of the brain on the other side, the right inferior functor gyrus, was encoding that information. And on average, it didn't do a very good job. So it didn't encode it as well than the good news. And as a result, people were less likely to incorporate unexpected bad news than unexpected good news. So we were wondering, can we change this? Can we change the way that people process information by changing the activity in the brain directly? Um, and there is at least one way that we could do that. And so this is my collaborator. And what he's doing is <clears throat> he's passing a small magnetic pulse through the scalp of this participant. And we can direct it, direct it specifically to part of the brain. So we can, for example, direct it to the inferior functor gyrus that I showed you, either left or right. And by doing that, we are interfering with the activity of this brain function for about half an hour. And after that, everything goes back to normal, or so we hope. So um, doing that, that was a delayed response. So doing that half hour, we could have the participant do our task, OK? And we did this for um, three groups of participants. One group was the control group. So it's as if I would test all of you now. And I would measure how much you learn more from good news and bad news. So this is, on average, how much you would learn more from good than bad. Then we interfered with a part of the brain that was encoding negative information. We interfered with it. And so the bias became even larger. And when we interfered with a part of the brain that was encoding good news, we interfered with it. The bias disappeared altogether. So we were quite amazed by this. So we could change this kind of deep-rooted bias by changing activity um, in the brain. But of course, we're not going to go around zapping people's brains. Um, and so what that means that on average, when people get bad news, yeah, go ahead. Did the interference reduce people's ability to learn or increase their ability to learn correctly? So first of all, it's obviously selective, right? Because different parts interfere with learning either from good or bad, right? And so what is the difference between learning and learning correctly? Can you? So overall, it's not a general interference with learning. It's valence specific, right? Right. So if you interfere with the part that makes them learn very strongly from good news, then does that mean that they learn less strongly from good news or that they learn equally strongly from good and bad news? Like, th does it improve the learning of bad news or decrease the learning of good news? Yeah, OK. So that's a very good question. And, um, so it, sh it depends on, on which part we were looking at. So in fact, um, it's, it, the story is a little bit more complicated, which is when we interfered with, a part, with that part, what we actually also found um, was an inhibition of learning from bad news. So the good, good news area, it's not really a good news area, but you know, that part was not only encoding positive information, it was also inhibiting learning from negative information. And we actually followed this up with um, an experiment using DTI. So DTI basically looks at white matter connectivity between different neurons, regions. And what we could find was that people who had better connectivity between these regions, the left inferior functor gyrosins particularly, and subcortical regions that were important for emotion and memory and learning, people who had better connections showed more of a bias because of two things. Both they learned better from positive, and they learned worse from negative. So that suggests, it's only a suggestion, that there could be inhibition as well as implication, amplifying learning from positive, but also inhibition from, from negative. So very good question. I just, um, yeah. So um, right. OK, so what this means um, on average, and also just one little note, there's individual differences. So for example, in depressed individuals, we don't find this. 
So they don't have it. They have like um, the same learning from positive and negative. And I'll also, hopefully I'll have time in the end to show you that I actually, this changes according to your own mental state. So this is not something that's stable even within an individual. It actually changes in response to what's going on in the environment and whether you're in a safe environment or dangerous environment. So it's a very flexible system. Um, okay, but on average, for most people in relaxed circumstances, it means that we tend to learn more from the good news than the bad news. And so when people see, uh, smokers see something like this, they say, yes, smoking kills, but mostly it kills the other guy, right? But when they get the good news, which is the housing market is going up, which it seems to be going here, people say, oh, my house will definitely rise in price. Um, so what we can take away from this is that we often need to reframe our message to try and figure out, can I reframe it to highlight the progress, not the decline? And I'll, let me give you a few examples, and then I'll give you a more empirical example. So for example, you know, instead of telling a kid if you smoke, you would get cancer, you might also say, well, if you don't smoke, you're more likely to get on the basketball team. Or instead of telling someone if you take Route A, you will lose time and money, so highlighting decline, you might say if you take Route B, you will gain time and money. Right? So highlighting what we need to do to get to progress rather than highlighting what has been done to decline. Um, and let me give you one example, empirical example, so um, we all know that hand washing is the number one way to reduce the spread of disease. So in a hospital in the East Coast, cameras were installed to see how often medical staff will wash their hands before and after entering a patient's room. Um, and the medical staff knew that the cameras were installed. It wasn't a, a nanny camera situation. Nonetheless, only 10% of medical staff, so one in 10, would wash their hands before and after entering a patient's room. But then an electronic board was introduced, and the electronic board told the medical staff in real time how, how well they were doing. So every time the medical staff washed their hands, there were actually people in India watching them, and they automatically give, gave them like, good feedback on the electronic board. It said, like, well done, uh, good job, and also the numbers went up, showing the current shift rate and the weekly rate going up immediately. And what they found was that um, compliance raised to 90% almost immediately, and it stayed there. So this effect is so large that you know, it seems a little bit suspicious. So the research team made sure to replicate it in another division in a hospital. This time the medical staff started at 30%, so one in three medical staff washed their hands before and after entering a patient's room, which is actually closer to the average. So the average both in hospitals and restaurants is 38%. Um, but then the electronic board was introduced and again went up to 90% immediately. Okay, so why does this intervention work so well? And here is like the general message, right? It's not about hand washing. The reason this intervention works so well, one of the reasons is that instead of using the normal approach, what would be the normal approach? The normal approach in hospitals is to warn medical staff of bad stuff in the future, of decline, right, of disease. Instead of doing that, what they did was they highlighted the possibility of progress by showing the medical staff the numbers going up every time they wash their hands. And it did one more thing. It gave the medical staff immediate rewards. So every time they washed their hands, there was a positive feedback, right? And we know that positive feedbacks activate reward regions in our brains. There's a reward signal in our brain that reinforces the action that caused it. And so that action is more likely to be repeated in the future. Um, and that's our, actually our next um, factor that we're going to talk about, which is immediate rewards. And here, both, yeah. Isn't it also that they're being watched? So that they, I can't, yeah. <laughs> It's also that they're they're being watched. That they're uh, I mean the the message is that they're they're so, being they're being yeah. monitored and and no so we right know away. that's not the case because they were monitored and then it was ten percent so they were monitored the first thing they did was monitor them telling them that they were monitoring them and that's where the ten percent came from that's the first point right and then they introduced the electronic board and then it went up did they try going. We're watching you. We're watching. <laughs> I don't know. They just, I think they just told them they were going to be watched. So monitoring alone seemed to not have much of an effect. 
But there are other reasons, which I talk about in the book. I just don't have time to talk about everything today. But for example, social norms come, come in, right? Because what they see is like, oh, look, now 65% of, of my colleagues wash their hands, right? So it's not only these two issues. It's a very smart design because it, it really has a lot of things. There's other, there are even other things that, that matter here. It gives them control, um, that it's their choice, and they can, so there's other things. But it's not monitoring that they knew that. So I've, I've like seen a lot of studies around how pain and uh, what? pain or like fear also like motivates more than rewards. And I haven't really dug into any of it, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, so we're going to talk about it now. So I'll talk about when rewards are better and when fear is better. So we'll start with the rewards. So um, when we talk about immediate rewards, both words matter a lot. So first of all, immediate and rewards. So we find when we talking focus about immediate first, we find that immediate rewards are more effective than rewards that you can get in the future for at least two reasons. One is known as the attribution problem. So imagine your partner is washing the dishes, and then you give them a kiss. Um, so it's clear that the kiss is related to washing the dishes, and so they're more likely to wash the dishes again in the future. Now, imagine that your partner is washing the dishes, but then you give them a kiss the next day. It's now not, that, not clear that the kiss is related to washing the dishes, right? And so it's less likely to um, um, strengthen that action. So immediacy helps because of that. And then at least one other reason is called temporal discounting. So we know that people value rewards now more than the same rewards that they can get in the future. So for example, if you ask people, do you want $100 now or 110 next week, most people will take $100 now. Right? And at least one reason is that if you get the money now, it's certain. Right? It's in your hands. But 110 next week, well, it's, there's something uncertain about it. And people don't want uncertainty. So that's another reason why immediate works so well. Now the question about rewards versus punishments. So why do rewards, why are they more likely to induce actions than punishments? And when do punishments work? Well, one reason that we find that rewards are more effective at enhancing action is because of what's known as the approach avoidance uh, rule. So in life, to get the good stuff, whether it's chocolate cake or um, love or promotion, we usually need to act, right? We need to approach. We need to do something. And so our brain has evolved in an environment where action is a way to get rewards. And so our reward system is very much connected to our motor system. Um, and I'm just going to, I'm showing you part of the reward system here. So um, down here, we have the midbrain. So these are the same neurons that Ethan uh, recorded from in his monkeys. So we have duponergic neurons down there in the midbrain. They go up into the center of the brain, the stratum, the nucleus accumbens, which is what usually people talk about when they talk about the reward center in the brain. And then you go into the motor cortex, uh, sorry, into the cortex and the motor cortex. Um, and what we find is that when you anticipate something good, a go signal is activated from the midbrain, and it makes action more likely. However, to avoid the bad stuff in life, whether it is poison or untrustworthy people or deep waters, mostly the best uh, approach is not to do anything, just to stay put, not to take an action, not to take a risk. Not always, but often that's the best approach. And so the brain has adapted to that environment and when people anticipate a loss or something bad, there is a no-go signal in the brain, and it inhibits action. So again, coming from the midbrain to the motor cortex and inhibiting action. What um, a study that was led by Mark Gitard Masip that I collaborated on as well, um, what he did, he showed that if you promise people a dollar for pressing a button, they will be quicker at pressing the button than if you promise them um, a dollar and uh, sorry, then if you then if you tell them that you will take away a dollar for them pressing the button, right? So if you say I'll give you a dollar for pressing the button, you do they do it quicker than if you tell them if you press the button, I won't take away a dollar from you, a loss, right? So they're quicker to do actions to get a reward. The opposite happens when you, they need to not act. So when we tell them, don't press a button, and we will get you a dollar, we'll give you a dollar. Or when you tell them, don't press a button and you won't lose a dollar, 
they make less mistakes when they don't need to press a button in order not to lose a dollar. Right? The reason, again, is that when you tell them don't press a button to get a dollar, sometimes they just immediately press a dollar because the anticipation of reward causes action. Okay? So that's kind of the connection between rewards and action and punishments and inaction. So back to your question. Um, it seems that if you want to motivate action, like you want to get employees to, do a, to work on a report really well, or if you want your kid to tidy their room, perhaps promising a reward would be better than threatening with punishment. But if you want someone not to do something, so you want your kid not to eat a cookie, or you want your employees not to share privileged information, perhaps the threat of a punishment would be better. Um, so we have to be very cautious from taking this basic science to more like real world application, right? But if that's true, if that connection is true, that's what this suggests. Um, okay, so then you can see why um, telling the medical staff, you know, threatening them that if they don't wash their hands, sorry, if they, that they need to wash their hands, otherwise they'll be diseased, didn't work as well as promising them a reward, which was positive feedback. Okay, and we know like positive feedback, I mean, you can give people money, that could be a reward, but these little likes on Facebook even work so well, right? So people go out of their way just for a little kind of like on Facebook or a positive feedback. So those are actually quite effective. Let me just make this last point, which is um, a really important thing for all of this is to consider the mental state of the person in front of you. I mean, I already told you that things are different under depression, for example, um, but they're also different under different mental states like stress. So what we find is that under stress, the brain function changes a lot, and the way that we process information changes really, really fast. And people become hypervigilant to negative information around them. So for example, in one study, we brought people into our lab, and we asked them to, and we told them, I'm going to give you a task, and then I'll give you a surprise topic, and you're going to give, you have to give a talk about the surprise topic in front of everyone. We're going to judge you. We're going to record you. We're going to put it in YouTube. So basically what I'm doing today, but I prepared. Um, and people got really stressed. We made sure they were stressed. We looked at their cortisol and their saliva. We looked at skin conductance. So when you stress, you start sweating, and your skin conductance goes up. We asked them, are you stressed? Yes, they were stressed. And then we did the same experiment that I showed you earlier, um, where we give you information that could be unexpectedly good or unexpectedly bad, and we see whether you incorporate that information into your beliefs, right? Like, you know, oh, you're more likely to get cancer, you're less likely to be a victim of card fraud, and so on. What we found was that under stress, immediately, people became more likely to incorporate negative information into their beliefs than they were just a few seconds ago. And then at that point, there wasn't a bias, what we call a desirability bias. It went away. They were, they were balanced in how they took in the good news and the bad news. We did the same experiment with firefighters in the state of Colorado. So the interesting thing about firefighters is that their day can be quite varied. So some days are relaxed, they're in, you know, they're in the station, they're just relaxing, and some other days are really their life-threatening events, right? And they did our studies um, in the station, and they had different days. Some are stressed, some are not. And what we found was on stressful days, when they were stressed out, they were more likely to take in the information that we gave them that was negative than on relaxed days. Although the information had nothing to do with their job, right? It's this general enhancement of taking in bad news that stress causes. It's not a specific. So you can see how, in response to stressful public events, like uh, market collapse or terrorist attacks um, or um, natural disaster, a lot of the stuff that we had recently, causes people to be stressed. Even if the event is halfway around the world, people often, their stress levels go up. And that what happens is that people start getting hypervigilant to negative information in the media, more likely to take it in. That makes them more pessimistic, sometimes overly pessimistic, and that could cause suboptimal decisions. So for example, after market collapse, we often find that people decide to uh, sell stocks where really the best thing to do is hold on. Or after terrorist attack, people cancel holidays or decide not to go on a plane but go in a car instead. Again, suboptimal decisions. And interestingly, it changes with age. So stress changes in a very predictable manner with age. So stress is quite low in kids and teenagers. It goes up, 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 reaching peak in your midlife, and then starts going down again. And happiness goes the other way. So happiness is quite high 
in kids and teenagers, down, 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 reaches the bottom in midlife. But then it starts going up again. And that's the good news, right? So if you're, if you're in the slum now, there's good news. And, um, and it stays up until the last couple of years of life. So what happens, let me just end with this note, which is what happens if this is a guy that you're dealing with, right? Um, and actually, what you want to do is reduce stress and increase happiness. So one thing to think about is that our studies show that the thing that matters to happiness the most is not necessarily what's happening to you now, but what you expect will happen to you in the future. And I'm actually going to give you an example from a study conducted at Harvard, uh, where people were asked a few days before vacation how happy they were, a few days during vacation how happy they were, and a few days after vacation how happy they were. So which day do you think they were the happiest? Before, before right, right. So the day that we're still in work, you know, sitting in their desk, that was a day that they were happiest. Because in their mind, they were already on vacation. And in the mind, it was, it was perfect. And they went, they went to vacation, it was pretty nice, but it never was as good as it was in their mind, or at least often not. So what that means is that an easy way to reduce stress and increase happiness is to create anticipatory events. Always have events that we could look forward to. Right? Have that vacation plan, have like whatever weekend activities you like planned, both for yourself and for the family or for the company. So employees have things to look forward to. OK, so I think I'm just going to um, end here, which is um, just with a kind of a general note that most people are not aware of exactly how their brain works and all these biases that we have. Right? We don't, we're not aware every day that we're trying to confirm our beliefs all the time or that stress will change how you process any kind of information. Um, but becoming aware of it means two things. A, it means that we might become more conscious of our own beliefs and decisions, why we have them, why we do it. Um, and second of all, if we know how other brains around us work, we might be better able to communicate advice and information to others. Um, so I think that would be it. And we might take a few cash questions before. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much. But um, we can ask some questions now how we could improve decision making, um, our own decision making and that of others. So if there are any questions now in the audience, um, please, please go ahead. From the experiment where they should not push the button to not lose a dollar, that that was more successful. Right. But when we put something on a cigarette pack that says they're going to take something from them, it sounded less successful than saying, hey, you can get on the basketball team instead. Right, right, right. So That's a very, very good point. So I think that in order to um, quit smoking, so you know, those warnings are not too bad for people who never approached smoking. The problem with those warnings are people who, who already smoke. That's where we really don't see much of an effect. And I, I thought about exactly this question. And I think that the, what is happening is that in order to quit smoking, you need to take action. So you actually have to find alternative things that you could do, um, whether it's gum or like, you know, you have to, to find different routines. And you actually, it actually does include some, some actions. So I think that could be the reason for that. But yes, good observation. OK, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um,